Today is October the 24th in 2023, and my guest is Richard Hanania. Richard is the founder and president of the Center for the Study of Partisanship and Ideology and the author of books such as The Origins of Woke and Public Choice Theory and the Illusion of Grand Strategy. This will be a far-reaching conversation with an emerging star public intellectual. Richard's writings have massively grown in the last couple of years. And now he commands a wide and increasingly mainstream following. Many people that I follow as well, such as Brian Kaplan, who's been on the show. So I've come to appreciate Richard's writing a lot. I think it's particularly honest, but he's not shying away from taking controversial positions, but then also offering nuance around them and admitting when he changes his mind, saying, hey, I was wrong on this. So I think this makes for specifically engaging topics that he's covering and that we want to cover today in the episode. First off, Richard, welcome to the show. And can you tell us a bit more about your background and your story? Yeah, thanks for having me on, uh, Nicholas. Yeah, I am, uh, you know, I'm academic background, um, I background in law, political science. I had some research fellowships. I've written academic papers. I wrote an academic book. Um, and so that's, you know, been most of my adult life. Um, around 2020, I started uh, just writing for sort of public consumption. Um, it really took off. I mean, I just started on Twitter and then started on a Substack. Um, had opportunity to start my own think tank where I can, uh, you know, bring together people who I think are doing interesting work. And uh, yeah, so for the last about three years, um, that's what I've been doing. Yeah, I see many parallels. I also studied IR, economics, philosophy, uh, and, and then I actually had the opportunity to do a PhD, but my mentor advised me against it. Nicholas, mm. you should go into get a uh, get a real job first. Yeah, good men good mentor. Good, good advice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, now you're increasingly independent with Substack as well, right? So you're not having to follow the academic grind. Oh, uh, yeah. I have no academic affiliation. I was at the University of Texas for a while um, that uh, ended uh, this summer. Um, and uh, now I'm just Substack and then my own think tank. And uh, yeah, completely independent. Can do what I want. Yeah, it's great life to be independent, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, Richard, what is a Nietzschean liberal? Uh, so I'm trying to rec I have these like instincts where, you know, and part of me is classical liberal. Um, you know, I, I believe in all the libertarian arguments on economics. Uh, you know, I, the uh, intuitive sense to me, liberty, you know, over equality or community or these other values people have. So, you know, I'm, I'm a classical liberal, I'm a libertarian. Um, and I, you know, I also like I'm just using Nietzsche as sort of a shorthand. Uh, you know, I don't like this game. I'm not a political theorist. I don't like this game of like, what does this philosopher actually mean or whatever? But Nietzsche is just sort of a shorthand for the idea that some things are better than others. Like it's good to like be strong and successful and handsome and wealthy and, you know, all these things. Um, and I want to, you know, sort of reconcile these views. So I, I, I wrote an article recently, um, uh, you know, saying that basically liberal democracy, you know, you, you have a lot of these people who are, Nietzschean and they go to fascism um, or they go to some kind of authoritarian ideology. Oh, you know, the masses are, you know, this is, you think like democracy or capitalism even is a kind of egalitarian ideology, which just lets the, uh, you know, the most common person sort of, you know, uh, tell, you know, the better person what to do. I think it's quite the opposite. I think, you know, authoritarian regimes um, have traditionally done that a lot more. Uh, democratic capitalist regimes have let a few people get uh, health, you know, uh, wealth and uh, uh, success and and influence a lot more than others, bringing everyone else along too. It doesn't require, I think Nietzsche actually thought that like you have to press people, right? I don't know, Nietzsche scholars disagree with that. I don't know, but regardless, um, you know, you could bring everyone else along with you just because it's the greatest uh, system for the greatest number, but particularly, you know, for the most talented and the most ambitious uh, among us. Um, so I'm trying to sort of make, you know, not make liberals into Nietzscheans. I think that's a hard thing, but sort of make Nietzscheans into more, more liberal, which I think, which I think is more of a, uh, is more of a sort of a, um, because I sort of see the Nietzsche thing is more instinctual. And I see the liberal thing, um, classical liberal thing is sort of more rational. Um, so if you don't have those Nietzschean instincts, if your instincts are egalitarian, which I don't, uh, you know, I can't relate to at all, then I don't know how to convince you that you should just like, you know, people doing great things. Um, uh, but if you're, if you're already there with me instinctually, then I try to take you along to say, and you know, you don't have to go in this direction. You can go in this other direction. Yeah. Um, 
Do you have a take or a riff on the role of public intellectuals? What's good and what's bad about them? Um, yeah, it's a broad, it's a broad topic. I've been, you know, I've sort of won my, I'm become one myself and I've been watching and reading public intellectuals for a very long time. I, I think they have a very necessary role because I've been in academia. Um, and what they do 90% of it, you know, I, I used to think like academics are sort of kind of public intellectuals because sometimes you see them, they write op-eds, they give talks, but it's very, you know, their influence on the public is very, very little. Um, and so you need someone to sort of, you know, translate, both translate the world of, you know, the world of ideas into sort of public policy or like relevance, uh, but also sort of, you need people to synthesize things and bring them together because a lot of academics, you know, they're just, we just talked about Nietzsche. You talk about any philosopher from 150 years ago, they had opinions on science and, you know, aesthetics, and that's very, very discouraged in modern academia. And it draws a kind of person who doesn't want to do that. So like someone will study, you know, this very, very narrow topic and sometimes they'll claim expertise in like everything. So, um, you know, you'll have like someone who studied, I don't know, the history of, uh, they, they take a prominent example, history of uh, Eastern Europe during World War II. And they'll say, well, there's not, and now I'm an expert in fascism and I know Trump and I know American politics and I know like what's motivating the voter. Right. And they, it's, it's sort of BS because nobody has that much expertise where they know Nazi Germany and Soviet communism and America too. But the academic sort of sometimes can pretend that he does. Um, the public intellectual, you know, doesn't, you know, doesn't maybe know the one thing in depth as much, but it's taking a little here and a little there. Um, you know, at their best, that's what they're, that's what they're doing. Um, you know, at, at, I don't think, you know, I would say, you know, at the, at, I have a general, um, you know, when I think of public intellectual, when you say that term, I think of like sort of a hybrid, I think of like Andrew Sullivan or Sam Harris, but like today we have these people who are just, they're not writing essays or books or anything. Uh, they're just on Twitter sharing memes. Um, I'm sharing videos. So I think we have seen sort of a, I, I think this has become a more kind of prominent kind of an intellectual, quote unquote intellectual, um, right. you know, in the, with the rise of social media, with the rise of Twitter. Uh, and that's unfortunate. So I think they're sort of, they're becoming, they're, they're sort of, a, they're more following the mob. I think maybe 20 years ago, they were maybe more sort of setting trends and opinions. Now they're just following the mob. You know, they're, if they're, if the, if they get the most clicks, the most engagement from this view or that view, uh, there's tens of people who are sort of following the audience rather than vice versa, which, which is unfortunate. I think it's, I think it's a dying art form actually to be a public intellectual that I've done, you know, okay. In it. Yeah. I mean, it challenges that there's no filtering mechanisms when they say the truth. So you launched a prediction market recently <laughs> as, yeah. as one mechanism. We also talked about that in a podcast with Robin Hansen. One thing I find challenging is that there's a market for ideas uh, and for the ideas that you like. Right. So you always find like an economist that supports like the minimum wage and makes up some some argument for it or finds some data. Right. So mm -hmm. th th I think that makes it challenging, but it also makes the good public intellectuals even more important. But we need a mechanism to figure out, you know, how that is. Do you want to talk a bit about your plan with launching the prediction market? Um, oh, so it's, I'm not launching. Um, I am joining uh, coming on with a company called Insight Prediction. Uh, so it's, uh, you know, it's just, I've always been a big fan of prediction markets. Um, I'm now working, I'm now working with them. Um, but, you know, it's just a way to sort, you know, it's, as you know, you had, you had Robin on, um, you know, it's a way to sort of hold people accountable for me. It's been a way to make a little bit of money. I've done pretty well on, uh, American politics in particular, just always vote on, always bet on Trump. Um, always bet on Trump to stay at the leader of the Republican party. He's seven years. You, you'll never, you'll never go wrong. Um, you know, people want the free advice. They won't take it though. They're still, they'll still not believe in Trump. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, uh, you know, I, I want to sort of move from a place of just making all the arguments for prediction markets, which, you know, Robin and others have made them, you know, they're, they're out there. I think they're pretty much irrefutable. Um, but you know, we have to, it's a regulatory issue. It's, it, it's a, it's a issue of sort of, it's an implementation and it's, it's not even an implementation. I mean, what the kids have done at, uh, the kids, you know, the young guys at Manifold have done is pretty amazing. Uh, um, poly market is amazing. There's a lot of amazing, you know, predicted the good system. It's just the law. Each one has this flaw, right? Um, either you can't use it in the U S has to be cryptocurrency or you have limits on predicted. You, the one you can use just cash directly from the U S I wrote a, um, I wrote an essay, how to legalize prediction markets. Um, because I think there's not enough attention paid to sort of exactly what you can do. The, people, the folks at Kelsey have been, uh, working on this a little bit, but yeah, it needs more. 
you know, I, people who are listening to this who are maybe, you know, uh, you know, rich guys or people who have like a, you know, an ability to sort of influence politics, you know, there needs to be more thought in just like advocating us because it's doable. I mean, you know, con- a congressman or a senator will take up a cause, something will happen. Most people don't care in Washington. Most people are not, you know, they probably don't like changes from the status quo, but they're not like, oh my God, prediction markets is the worst thing in the world. Like nobody is really I think, thinking like that. Um, so there's opportunities here to do something. And I'm, you know, by working with inside prediction, um, and people, I can keep track of my own, um, predictions. People can go to my sub stack. It's a se- second to last article. Um, but you know, um, yeah, I just want people to, you know, be involved and think more about how we can make prediction markets a bigger part of our culture. Yeah. I wonder if you've thought a bit about the public intellectual, um, issue in conjuncture with elite overproduction. Um, the, I don't know. So the like, elite I, overproduction idea, Peter Turchin is, I think the most recent example, yeah. but Robert Nozick and Thomas Sowell also had like big pieces. And I read this when I read Joseph Schumpeter's book, it was like in 1943, that was his explanation for how capitalism will go down because it produces too many of these intellectuals. And he analyzed them very deeply from like a class point of view, right? And it's all could be telling uh it could could be today eight years later it's almost the same kind of environment right sort Mm. of you know a woke mob in companies that's pushing out the entrepreneurs and taking over and building a bureaucracy so yeah um from the yeah i mean we did do we did have a big mistake what by you know not just this country but you know i think uh over most of the western world of expanding higher education uh too much um you know it's 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 mostly signaling it's not doing people much good it does it, it doesn't make people smarter but it makes them feel like they're smarter and it makes them feel entitled um to have more of a say in sort of how other people live their lives uh so in that context you're right i mean the, as far as public intellectuals that you know it, it, it's, it tends to be such a small market anyway i don't think most overeducated elites are public intellectuals right they're just advocates or they're on Twitter just complaining, but no one's paying attention to them and getting frustrated or they have some academic job where they don't matter all that much. Um, yeah, but public intellectual is sort of a very competitive and small field. So I don't know if that's elite. That's still the elite that are right to stop. Either they're the smartest or they're the best at appealing to an audience yeah. um, of some kind, right? So the public intellectual was maybe the wrong framing. I had more in mind um, sort of the, so what Schumpeter and others mean by sort of intellectual elite is more the over the educated ones, the ones with degrees that go on to become like political staffers or administer or university administrators and all of that. So that's a much broader kind of class. Yeah. 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 I agree. I mean, I agree there's, there's a negative imp- impact on, I don't believe in Turchin's theories that's going to cause civil war. I think he's, you know, some of his theories on like rise and fall of states is pretty crazy. Uh, but the idea that, you know, you have a lot of people with degrees and they're sort of inherently anti-capitalist it's it's you know it's interesting i mean people go out in the world and just like reality just has a way of you know uh, i was reading some stuff recently about how delayed family formation is because people spend too much time in college and you know they're they're in the mode of thinking that they're children their mentality is that they're still children right so they're not getting uh, you know families and they're you know in their 20s and then they'll, they'll go into the till they're 30 if they're going to get a graduate degree right and then it's almost too late <laughs> you know almost you're almost, you know, middle age by then. Um, and so, yeah, we need, we need just less of education. That's something that, you know, I've always believed a lot in for, you know, there's just a lot of, re- it's, it's too, almost too many reasons to list as to why, you know, education, the expansion of education has been a disaster. Yeah. Yeah. And I got to definitely send you the Schumpeter passages because it will ring very familiar to what's going on today, mm-hmm. especially how they need to like cater to minorities and champion all these fringe causes and things like that. Um, but anyway, I'd love to talk about your book, The Origins of Woke. Um, first off, can you give a synopsis of what the book is about and why you wrote it? Yeah. So people tend to think wokeness is kind of this, this cultural trend, like something happens, you know, there's a, uh, you know, a hysteria over race or gender issues and people thinking this is racist and this is sexist. Um, it's, you know, there's a deep sort of legal history. Um, behind these ideas and sort of the ideas themselves sort of in many cases followed legal innovation. So after the Civil Rights Act of 64, um, you know, there were like doctrines developed, like the, uh, like the government started forcing people to pay attention to the race and the gender of their, you know, employees. 
and to seek balance, right? They started going after them for having standardized tests or different kinds of employment criteria um, that had a, a, you know, a disparate impact on one group or the other. And so my argument is that, you know, it's a very sort of ambitious argument. It's that like some basic changes in the law reshape corporations, reshape all kinds of institutions. Um, and this eventually led to a cultural change where now we just think in racial categories and we think in group disparities um, and the way we specifically think about these things in the American context, that there's basically a legal regime behind all this. So I bring, I bring, you know, the sort of the tools of social science, you know, I, I, do, I do the history, I do sort of the, uh, uh, the tracing of like the, you know, the temporal, what, co what comes before uh, what, I, I have some data on, you know, how institutions develop over time. Uh, and I think I tell a pretty convincing story that, you know, wokeness is rooted in civil rights law. Yeah. Can you talk a bit more about that? How it's rooted in civil rights law and what, uh, what specifically kind of the legal architecture of that? Yeah. Um, and the, so there's, you know, a lot of different things. So there's civil rights act just says don't discriminate based on race uh, and sex. Um, what happens is they come to define discrimination to mean don't have do anything that has a, you know, a negative impact on one group or the other. So standardized tests became problematic. Um, even like law and regular law enforcement, if you arrest one group or if you stop one group more than the other, uh, that became problematic. Um, government also did some other strange things like, you know, they, they started like, you know, they, they, uh, made it possible she could sue someone for not just like refusing to hire them or something or creating an environment that was uncomfortable for someone based on their group characteristic, uh, punitive damages, um, were part of this. Um, which means that corporations had to pay a lot of money if they were found liable. Um, there was also affirmative action that was forced onto government contractors, um, which is covered like, you know, it covers now 25 or 30 percent of the uh, workforce. Um, and basically what this led in, what this led to was a, um, a shift within institutions where there was the rise of the human resources industry, um, which was much smaller. Uh, before, before civil rights law than it was after. And I, you know, I have data on tracing the rise of this in the 19th, starting in the 1960s and 1970s. Um, and so, and, you know, I have, uh, I cover a lot. I mean, I go into corporations. I also have, um, about the universities, how like race consciousness was actually forced on the universities originally as a way, um, to see if they were d discriminating or not. And there was actually resistance, um, you know, sort of like the micromanagement of, um, uh, relationships at universities under Title IX. Uh, that's also part of the book. Um, and so, yeah, I go into all of this sort of detail. Um, and then I, you know, give some advice for, you know, what people can do about it. Okay. So how does that then lead to or woke today, right? Why do we, uh, so you're saying it's not like woke as a culture that's sort of bringing all these changes, is that these changes brought the culture. Yeah. Exactly. So the idea that like, uh, institutions basically, you know, for example, like, you know, one idea that's central to wokeness is if there's one, uh, you know, if there's a disparity, that means it's caused by discrimination. There's also the idea that you have to restrict speech, um, on sensitive issues. Now these are direct mandates, uh, from law, uh, right. Um, and so like, especially like the harassment law, I mean, it, it's very clear, um, and legal scholars have shown that the only way to protect yourself as an employer uh, is to have a kind of zero tolerance, uh, policy, uh, towards, you know, flirtatious jokes or, or whatever. Um, and what this does is it, you know, it's, it's sort of vague standards. They're not exactly telling you what's allowed or what's not. Um, and basically a lot of, uh, HR bureaucracies have come in to, to explain to employers who are not paying attention to this stuff, who are just trying to, you know, make money and, 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 uh, you know, fulfill their business mission. Um, you know, they're sort of outsourcing this human relations, you know, uh, a human, re the human relations to human resources, um, who are just basically inventing the rules. Um, and there's sort of an arms race between corporations because each one has to sort of avoid the bureaucracy and avoid a uh, civil rights lawsuit. Right. Um, and so it's sort of, you know, it has institute, it, it has a sort of a subtle effect where like, if you measure something, you know, if I told you and you have a job, you have a job and I tell you you know, classify your employees over six feet tall and under six feet tall. Um, and then make sure, you know, the ones that are over six feet tall are not getting too much, you know, too many opportunities at the expense of those under six feet tall. Um, and, you know, make sure that they're not making jokes about the, you know, you're going to, everything about your business changes, right? You've constructed a reality where you have to think about height 
all the time. Um, and even when you hire someone, you say, is this person under six feet or over six feet? Am I going to have to, you know, I'm going to, am I going to have a complaint if I have to hire him? If I don't hire him, you know, is there going to be a complaint? Is he going to get along with the other uh, workers or is he going to fit in in this environment? And so there really is, you know, just like there's direct mandates um, that do things, them, but there's also direct mandates and like uh, vague, man, vague, vague sort of, you know, suggestions that the government has for a lack of a better term that um, really shape the way people think and really shape the way institutions function. So it's not that there's no culture, there's no independent force of culture or ideas. You know, that's not what I'm saying. It's just that like the form that this took, this concern with black civil rights that we had in the 1960s, um, the fact that it sort of turned into this looks like this HR and corporations, uh, no standardized tests, uh, you know, uh, you know, Criti criticism of law enforcement because, you know, a lot of, a lot of cases are just doing their jobs, uh, how we define race, like who's, you know, wh why we have a Hispanic category, why we have an Asian category, fascinating, you know, story behind this. Um, a lot of that can just be explained by looking at, you know, sort of legal developments that nobody was really paying attention to at the time, but ended up having, uh, large downscale influences. I'd be interested in that in particular. I remember I heard an episode, podcast episode about it, and I was really mind blown how these racial classifications came about. Yeah, who do you who do you talk to in that? Uh... It was I don't remember who it was, but it was on Free Thoughts the podcast. The Free Thought was it Dave Bernstein? Because there's a guy named Dave Possibly, Bernstein. Possibly, yeah. He's that a like... professor of law at George Mason who just wrote a book on this topic mm -hmm, called mm -hmm. Classified, which came out in the last I think year year or so. Um, so that's again, you know, people can. Uh, look at that book. Yeah. And I also have a chapter on that in my uh, book too. Yeah. The Hispanic category was just sort of a, a, uh, you know, it was just sort of a, a mishmash. Uh, it was supposed to be Spanish speaking. Um, and somehow it got, you know, they, they started collecting data on Spanish speakers. Um, it like who was included, who was not was sort of, you know, some congressman would lobby for their particular interest group. Um, and then it sort of, it, it just became because they had the data, it had became a sort of self-referential cycle and it just became sort of a permanent category that, it, uh, that included, you know, people from certain countries and not others. There's the other, uh, fascinating one is Asian, um, Pacific Islander, which came, came together just because, uh, the delegation from Hawaii, uh, lobbied for an oriental category because the Asians were all living in Hawaii at the time. You know, that there was a, a majority, uh, it was a majority, I think, Hawa uh, East Asian and native Hawaiian state. Um, and they just put them all into the same category. Uh, later on, they divided them because the native Hawaiians, they didn't like, um, through their, uh, Senator, um, did not like the idea they were considered Asians for the purpose of college admissions, which, which hurt them. Um, and so they broke the groups, they broke the groups up, um, at some point, uh, but the entire, you know, I, I have ngram Google ngrams in my book, which show these categories, Hispanic, Latino, they take off in the 1960s and 70s, AAPI doesn't, a, a, the fr, a Asian American Pacific Islander, the, the yeah. term doesn't exist in the English language uh, before 1972, can't find a single case in any Google book. And you see it, it starts to, it starts to rise uh, after the government creates the category. Um, and so, yeah, you can, you know, you, how we classify race, sort of how we conceive of like socializing in the workplace, all these things are, um, uh, are sort of, you know, are sort of shaped and socially constructed by government. Yeah, that's so, so fascinating. I used to have a background in public opinion research where I had to like get all this data all the time and especially like across like hundreds of different countries sometimes. And just you realize how definitionally, you know, inaccurate it often is and sort of what you're doing to the data after once you make, make this decision every time. And you can just, and one, but once it's hard coded into law, it becomes part of the reality. So in a really real sense, this is like a social construction through like government law, right? So do you concede yeah. that point to the social constructivists? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's something to that, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, so, so you're saying that with like HR departments and um, sort of this government and NGO bureaucracy and all of that, that basically became a career path after civil rights law, right? So you needed sort of some universities that really promotes the kind of ideas you need to have to stuff that bureaucracy. Is, is that right? Yeah, I, yeah, it, it did become a career path. And then, you know, like just the lawyers, I mean, the lawyers too, civil rights law became part of law. So that was very lucrative too. Um, they can get, you know, uh, damages, they could get, uh, you know, they can get, um, 
uh, the defendant sometimes if they lose, they would have to pay um, for the lawyer's legal representations. The civil rights law became a huge part of uh, just the, you know, private lawsuits filed um, in federal court in the U.S. You know, civil rights laws have been, civil rights lawsuits have been 10 to 20% of them. I mean, it just became what government lawsuits became about. Um, and that was a big business too. There was a, uh, you know, the incentive structure created made them particularly profitable because of, again, attorney's fees and punitive damages. So you have, again, these like sort of seemingly small minutia kind of uh, uh, laws and regulations that end up having a huge effect on people's um, incentives. Yeah. There's a, um, I'm not sure it was a book or just a talk by Thomas Sowell on affirmative action around the world. And he yeah. showed like already in the 70s or 80s that that was not a U.S. thing that happens all over the world, right? And yeah. you think the explanation was interesting, right? So as soon as you have like a state, you basically have foodie that different coalitions and interest groups vie for. And at that point, it pays off to become like a political entrepreneur that is saying, hey, I'm representing this group, right? So you're like a Jesse James or something like that. So Jesse Jackson, Jesse, Jesse, Jesse James Jackson, was, yeah, yeah. was a old West, uh, uh, cowboy. Jesse Jackson. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Criminal. Yeah. <laughs> and he was the other guy in, in Washington, DC. Wow. Uh, which one are you talking about? Yeah. I, for, I forgot the name, but yeah, anyway, so there's this persona of the political entrepreneur that is basically portraying them as speaking for a group and then basically getting, um, well, booty. <laughs> From yeah. like the state and government money, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so yeah, here's a book. Yeah, that's a good book. Affirmative action around the world. Yeah, it's it's a it's a scam. I mean, it's sort of against the American, you know. It's it's sort of you know against the American tradition, and it would have to be sort of done sneakily in the United States in the in our con in our context. Um, but yeah, you know, it's it's you know this this uh, may may make one pessimistic about doing anything about it. Uh, at the same time, we sort of have to try. I think understanding sort of the government classification of the data collection as central uh, to this process, I think, is a you know is an important thing because if you don't have the what well, we don't have data on, we don't the government doesn't worry about. Uh, so I think that's like that's how it all started, and that's potentially you know one weak point of all this. Yeah. So, is the is what you're saying with the book? Um, would you agree with or disagree with Peter Thiel when he says that wokeism could be like a distraction of like a deeper seated problem or like stagnation in society? I think that, you know, I think that Peter sort of thinks that it might be, you know, I do think that we can exaggerate this a, a little bit. You know, I wrote a book on wokeness, so I think it's, I do think it's important, but, you know, because it annoys me a lot and it annoys a lot of people. Um, and so, you know, it's good to, you know, most people there is a reason and there's good reason to be upset about it and that the effects are not you know small i think they're large um but you know it's treated as the center of our politics it's treated as like you know like nothing else matters um and i do think there is or you know i do think there is a problem of stagnation and there is a problem of sort of you know like gov government regulation holding society back um, and wokeness is maybe a uh, sort of a one manifestation of this. It's just like this egalitarianism, the safetyism, nobody's feelings can be hurt. Um, we have to make sure everyone feels good and everyone's, uh, feels included. And, you know, the, we, we can't let businesses do what they want because maybe there will be discrimination and, you know, then we, you know, we can't have that. So we have to just have this, you know, this great government telling people what to do and, and sort of, uh, regulating everything, regulating everything they're doing. Um, yeah, you know, so I, I do think that these, there are sort of bigger, problems it's hard to mobilize i mean nobody cares about stagnation nobody cares the people you go to twitter right now and you just start tweeting about woke stuff and you know crime or like uh uh standard getting rid of math or standard like it's funny you know people have this like thing where like california has new math standards right that are like you know woke math like and then people will you know retweet that thousands of times uh and then you know if you're like just like some regulation that doesn't allow you to use math to do some important thing like, you know, nuclear, you know, something it's some people will be interested in it, but most people won't. They'll be interested in because, you know, if somebody did woke math, not if like math and engineering doesn't matter because you're not allowed to build anything like that's also, you know, something that should be uh, very concerning. So, yeah, this is sort of democracy. It's the woke, it's the woke side and the anti-woke side. They're very, uh, they're very, uh, you know, they're very, they, they're easy to mobilize around these issues.
So can you ever get one without the other, like the good side of democracy and with, without the woke stuff? Um, yeah, I think I mean, we, we didn't have, you know, woke stuff for most of our history. We had other bad parts of democracy. I think we've been going in the wrong direction uh, in the 40s and, you know, for like starting in the 1930s and 40s, really. Um, but yeah, I mean, we, yeah, I mean, it, you know, everything is compared to what, right? You have... You had Americans, you know, the big, um, you know, long periods of growth, you know, the 1960s and, uh, or, um, at 1950s and 60s, uh, you know, we were under a democratic system, but we, you know, we can, we had 19, I think 1990s were relatively good. I mean, compared to, um, what came, you know, what came after. Um, and so, yeah, you can, you can do it. I, I think you know, the question, is, yeah, I think the social media and, uh, the internet, um, have changed things a lot. So that's the most recent change, right? The last 15 years, I think it's had very, a lot of distortive effects on our politics. Like people think Trump, the rise of Trump is like, uh, uh, you know, because of outsourcing, I, I don't believe none of that nonsense. You know, I, I think it's just the internet, um, and sort of, you know, the people are getting more what they want. He represents the Republican voter. Always. He always represents the Republican voter. Just there's less gatekeepers. Now there's less any, anyone preventing, uh, somebody like that from becoming president. And the backlash to Trump is also sort of, you know, emotional, dr emotionally driven wokeness is also sort of grassroots. These people, these intermediate strata of highly educated, but not very rich, uh, part of society. Uh, so yeah, that's our, ch I mean, that's our challenge now it's democracy, uh, plus, you know, social media and the internet. Um, but that's changing too. I think there's, you know, probably the internet, you know, it's like Twitter, it's maybe a little less important than it was two years ago, three years ago. Maybe it'll stay the center of, of our world, uh, or maybe it become, maybe it fragments more than, you know, that's going to be just a new set of challenges or, uh, you know, sort of a new, uh, you know, new landscape on which we'll, we'll have these debates. Yeah. Um, what, what would you say, or I'm not sure if it's in the book or not, um, what role overall big tech plays, right? So you hinted a bit at that, that modern social media might aggravate differences. But then we also know there have been times in the past where things were maybe even more polarized, right? So how much of that is tech and how much of it you think also can be solved through tech, right? Because prediction markets is also something, is also tech basically. Yeah. And a lot, we need a lot of tech to get out of the stagnation, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it's contributed. The polarization, I think, you know, started in the American context really before the internet. It really starts taking off in the 19th. 90s and you have uh you know you have um uh talk radio so but you know you have a you have a technology that really takes off but the demand was there for something you know i think i have a, 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 a old article called the uh, psychological theory of the culture war um and i think the Amer i think in the american context it's sort of you know it's sort of a uh you know i, I you know, have a sort of this complicated theory where the elites really detest the masses. And the reason they detest the masses, uh, is because, you know, there's like, um, you know, they need to really, we, first of all, we're very wealthy. Um, and we also, uh, have, you know, ability to separate from one another. And we also have racial diversity. And the central question is, you know, what's, uh, you know, what, you know, what is sort of the problems of black Americans and what's causing it, which is, you know, this is a, going back to slavery, going back, uh, you know, our entire history, that's a major problem. And, you know, the sort of the, you know, the elites separate themselves for the masses and they want to feel better for them, particularly on these issues. Um, and the masses understand that. So they have resentment. It's not like the normal person loves capitalism or something. Maybe they love the symbol. You know, they say elites are socialists, so we're capitalists, right? But they, they don't like the specifics of capitalism. They don't care about that. No people do, right? Um, but yeah, and, and there's sort of this, you know, sort of negative feedback loop. And, you know, the internet has made that worse in the American context. Now, it's worse in the U S than it is in, uh, a lot of other countries and, you know, the other countries that have gone sort of the American route, they've been either under, you know, they've been American, uh, they either in the Anglo sphere, like, you know, sort of the UK and they're not as extreme as us and it's the polarization, but it's there. Um, or they've had the immigration issue, which has brought, uh, similar problems to our own underclass, at least in like France, although they're not polarized in like the way we're polarized. It's, it's, it's a very different thing. Um, and so, and so, yeah, I mean, there's a lot there, um, well, you know, tech bring us out of it. I don't know. Like, I think it could might distract us to the point where politics, like, I think politics around 2010, 2015 became more interesting than entertainment. And that's what got people into politics. So like Trump just made everything funny. 
um, and like these, you know, new identities and stuff like that. Like people were like, instead of, you know, playing a video game or, or, uh, watching a movie or something or getting into a subculture, we're really into politics. And so, you know, maybe we have, we go think where like, we have more entertainment like VR or something, right. Um, or just whatever more, you know, more distribution of games or, you know, uh, uh, you know, fantasy worlds or whatever. And then people are not so interested in politics anymore. Like that could be one way out of it. It could be, um, there could be a male female thing where men like video games and VR and women, not so much. So you need something else to sort of entertain women. Well, according to Jonathan Haidt and these people who uh, looked at like teen health, health of teen girls are looking at Instagram and becoming miserable and unhappy about that. And maybe, and like politics, left wing politics seems related to that, like, you know, rising misery and left wing politics among young women goes together. Um, but yeah, the internet will be sort of shaping what grabs our attention. And politics is just one of those things that potentially can grab our attention. And, you know, whether it does or not, I think the people who's, who are into politics because, you know, the sort of the marginal use, uh, consumer of political news or information, the person who would just go watch a video game or reality show or something instead, I think that person has more of a sort of unsophisticated sort of, you know, populist, uh, kind of, uh, uh, take, I think it makes them woke on the left or kind of like chewing on or, you know, extreme Trumpists on the right. Uh, so maybe peeling those people off can maybe make our politics less polarized and less crazy. Um, and so, yeah, we'll see if that actually happens. Great. To, to round up your views on domestic policy, um, there's a lot to be uh, worried about, but what would make you hopeful? Is there some kind of movement or sign that you see of, um, positive progress or growth and ending the stagnation or yeah, kind of, I mean, I think, I think there's some there. I mean, I think that, you know, the, you have Andreessen's techno optimist manifesto, you have these people you have, but those ideas are not so radical among smart leftists. Um, and so you have the Iglesias and like, you know, a Smith and these people, uh, you have the Klein and, uh, Derek Thompson talking about the abundance agenda and, and like you have, um, I haven't been paying that much a close attention to it, but the Yimby movement seems to have had success in California. The, the, I don't know how important the laws are. I, I see some people say they're very important and some people say they're not. Um, but the trend is certainly in the direction towards Yimbyism and sort of deregulation. So you have the, you know, nuclear power thing, uh, which people are agreeing more on. You have the Yimbyism that tr people are agreeing on. Um, and so it's like, it sounds like a lot of good ideas are coming. Uh, to the forefront um, is just, are they enough to overcome the inertia and the vested interests um, that are there and have prevented good things from happening? Uh, we'll see. But, you know, there's, I think things are moving in the right direction. I think wokeness, is, I don't know, you know, it peaked, you know, peaked to a certain extent. Um, but, you know, I think that like, you know, people are sort of, they can read my book and you know, there, there's just more initiative to like actually do something about it. And it's not like, that just increases polarization because I think that like you can get rid of a lot of this stuff and the left is not wedded to it as much as you might think. They just sort of have to defend it. Um, uh, but you know, you can create it, you can create sort of a new reality there. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I'm optimistic about America relative to the, um, rest of the world. I mean, will we, you know, uh, you know, the, the debt, the, I'll say the one bad thing is, um, the one sort of the negative on the horizon is that is the debt. Um, which is coming from social security and Medicare. And there seems to be no, um, political will to deal with that. Um, and so we're going to have to try to, you know, clean up budget ed energy and grow, but we're going to potentially, you know, be a much poorer country, um, if we have to raise taxes, uh, in order to cover the, um, uh, you know, the, the, what's been promised in these entitlement programs. So that's sort of a, you know, a sort of great, great cloud on the horizon. So there's, yeah, good things to look forward to and bad things too. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'd love to switch gear a bit and talk about your work on international relations. Um, can you talk a bit about your book, um, Public Choice Theory and the Illusion of Grand Strategy? What are you trying to do in the book and how does it now inform your thinking when you look at um, recent foreign policy issues? Yeah, I mean, it's sort of, it's it's similar to, in a way, it's similar to my, uh, my last book in that it, uh, uh, it really takes a sort of a bureaucratic sort of public choice kind of approach to the question. And, you know, I have an international relations background. It just, you know, sort of annoyed me that people saw international relations, saw like American grad strategy as a coherent sort of whole. 
um, that was like, you know, that was influencing the world. And, uh, you know, there's something to that, but I think there's all, also just a lot of path dependency. Um, so I do think the American sort of the American role in the world is just determined by, look, somebody made a decision a long time ago, and now this is our commitment and now we're going to stick to it indefinitely. And we're going to, um, we're going to sort of post hoc justify, uh, whatever we've been doing. Uh, so this is a, I try to explain sort of different aspects of American policy, the war on terror, like wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, uh, the U S approach to China, um, historically, um, through this and a few other things, uh, through this lens. And, um, so today I think there is more, I, I don't know. I think there's probably, it's probably become more coherent actually, since my book, um, I was really influenced by sort of the Bush era and then Trump. Um, under Biden, I think that like on NATO, there's been sort of more, and 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 then China, I think there's been more sort of what we could call grand strategy there. Uh, so it's maybe moved a little bit away from it. Um, but you know, the book I think still has something to teach people about, at least about our history of foreign policy and and sort of you know a different lens through which to understand it. Yeah, and, and I found one thing really interesting, and you said that in a couple of your blog posts, and it seems to me coming from sort of the public choice lens. And I'm quoting you, even though I think you deleted that passage in that blog article, right? The ethical case for the siege of Gaza. Which, which, I, don't think I, I don't think I deleted anything. What did I delete there? Hmm. Maybe. You, so it says, all states are inherently suspect as moral entities, with some being no, better no, or didn't. worse than others. Okay. No, okay. I then it. no I, yeah. Yeah, but anyway, I like that passage. And it says, continues, individuals generally have zero control over what policies their governments adopt, making the yeah. doctrine of collective responsibility just as pernicious here as it is in the frameworks of the wokes and Marxists. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, the, yeah, the people in Gaza are, of course, not responsible for Hamas's attack and same with the Israelis and same with Americans and American foreign policy. That's true. So to me, this is a red herring. Um, what to do, what Israel should do about Gaza, what the U.S. approach should be, you know, it has to be, I think, utilitarian because there is no individual rights or collective responsibility. People try to argue that way. This country has a right to do this. This country has a right to do that and responds. Uh, I just think that's not the right way to think about these things. Yeah, but then I think in a way you're questioning um, how nation states see themselves. They see themselves as sort of representing a collective in many ways, right? Yeah, I mean the whole Palestinian which I think is a good case, thing. I agree with you. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. This, I mean, that's a good point because the Palestinian they say, oh, they have a right to self determination. They have a right to have their own country. But then you say, oh, you know, you want collective responsibility for what you know, their leaders does. And then, no, no, no. So wait a minute, they have group rights or they don't have, uh, you know, they don't have a, they have a group right, but they don't have any group responsibility. I think that's a, that's a pretty strange place to be in. Um, yeah, you're right. People, it sort of does, you know, take, it sort of uh, delegitimizes a lot of, you know, a lot of the sort of the rhetoric out there. Yeah, yeah. Um... So it means, I mean, in the climate or situation, and you only really have tragic choices. Do you want to talk a bit about the choice that that Israel is facing and the tragedy of it? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that anyone is like any reasonable person can doubt at this point that uh, the Palestinian, you know, the Palestinians. I say the Palestinians don't want to. Like people will point to a poll or something, and they'll say, "Oh, most Palestinians." It's like it's not about what a poll says. It's like the people who are willing to pick up guns. Um, who are the most adamant and the most interested in the question and are going to have the biggest, like those people, maybe the 10% most animated of the population, right? Or 20% or, or whatever. They don't want to live by Israel. They don't want peace with Israel. I mean, I think that we know that maybe, maybe 55% support Hamas, maybe 40%. It doesn't matter that like whether people like will say, oh, they won the vote with this. And now the poll says they have this. That's not, you know, that's not the main, that's not the main point. Um, and so we can say the Palestinians you know, don't want peace with Israel, not uh, knowing that that doesn't mean a poll, that doesn't mean all Palestinians. That just means, you know, the way, the way I, I frame it. And I think what's important. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, and then you have to sort of, you have to fight the, um, you know, you have to fight Hamas, which, which is, you know, aggressive towards Israel, but you, and you, you know, but they also, you know, they hide among civilians, right? Um, and there's like, I was re listening to some podcasts this morning, Ezra Klein talking to uh, a guy named Spencer Ackman and Peter Bryant Beinard. And it was just like, what do you do? Ezra Klein asked him, you know, what do you do to Beinard? He's just like, well, 
I would uh, exchange for the hostages, you know, and uh, I would uh, go after the, <laughs> the terrorists. It's like, okay, yeah, it's a very simple idea. Very okay, just go after the terror. Like, you could just arrest them. Like, you know, it's, it's just like that. They, you know, it's just like, like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, this is, yeah, so like, you just, you know, show me that these people, they worry about the Palestinians, but they don't have any answer. They don't have any solution. Just go arrest, you know, arrest. Go, go, you know, target the people who did this. Like, yeah, you can't, that's what they've been doing. That's of course what they want to do. Um, but you know, they hide among the people and then, you know, somebody takes their place and there's infrastructure of the organization. Uh, and so that's, you know, that's, that's the issue. Um, and so, yeah, I think that, you know, I think the Israelis are going to have to sort of do a regime change with Hamas and just going to have to sort of neutralize the threat and neutralizing the threat means, um, creating a buffer zone between themselves and, uh, and Gaza, that's why I think they emptied northern, they told people to leave northern Gaza. I don't think they let them come back until it's completely, you know, they have complete control or maybe they just don't let them come back or let them come back in very small numbers. And otherwise, you know, try to get rid of Hamas and try to uh, uh, sort of just limit the spillover from uh, from Gaza, right? Like the other alternative is just, you know, be nice to them and, you know, don't, don't do this and, you know, they'll... Uh, uh, you know, and then, you know, then they'll want, you know, they'll have aspirations to live in peace side by side. I just don't think there's any evidence of this. Um, and that's, you know, that's the choice Israel faces at this point. Yeah, this, this makes IR, I think, so difficult because there's only these tragic choices, right? Initially, I was also more on the, hey, you know, one of the, what gives, you know, you have to take the utilitarian calculus. And then I got a bit more convinced by Brian Kaplan's pacifism which I found interesting, but he admitted himself, he doesn't know how it would apply to like Israel, right? Yeah. Have you discussed that with him at some point? Because his no, pacifism yeah. is... Has, Israel, has uh, Brian had written about this? Has he not really. I mean, he's him? openly admitting that he doesn't have, you know, and not, I mean, I don't think anyone has. I mean, I, I defer to, hey, it's a tragic choice. I have no skin in the game. So I defer to the ones who have to make and live with these tragic choices. Yeah. Um, but his general case for pacifism was... You know, with any of these utilitarian calculuses, all right? So, you know, we want this benefit and we have to take this risk. You're like, your benefits have to be very high and you have to be very certain about these benefits. And in real life, almost no like government or state's intervention is having these two, right? Having, you know, large yeah. benefits maybe, but this, it's rarely or, or ever certain, right? Yeah, especially I mean in the American context when there's so much uh, wars, so many wars of choice, right? I, you know, I, I never talked to Brian about this, but yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's hard to, uh, you know, maybe I agree with him in some ways on American foreign policy, but it's very hard to um, uh, apply that to Israel, right? Like if you're like in yeah, a, yeah. you know, pilgrims and you know they're you know you're uh, you're settlers in the West and there's you know Indians coming to raid your town, the, 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 the pacifist framework for American foreign policy. It doesn't really work. And I think that that's the situation uh, the Israelis is now say, you know, like, to be fair, some people will say, well, the Israelis have been, you know, blockading Gaza for a long time. And, you know, I, I and, you know, that's, that's true. Um, you know, that, that being said, I think that that's also for a good reason, because I don't think that the, I don't, I think the fundamental issue here culturally is that the Palestinians and Israel, the Palestinians don't want to live by the Israelis and they want the right of return and they won't uh, give that up. And, you know, they'll, they'll fight and die for it. That's, that's, I think, is the fundamental yeah, issue. Yeah. It's like, uh, I have a very good friend who's been very involved for like decades on the ground. And he said something interesting once. Uh, he said, uh, if the Palestinians won't be so stupid, Israel would be done for. If they would do the nonviolent resistance thing and denounce violence in their own ranks and just nonviolently protest like India Gandhi style, Israel would be done for. <laughs> Oh, I don't think that's, I don't think that's true. Actually. I think no? that's also naive. No, no. I think Israel would just take the settlement. I think in the West Bank, they would have, I think they got the, so now in Gaza, yeah, maybe, uh, because Gaza is, they, the Israel is gone from Gaza. I think the violence got Israel out of Gaza. And I think in the West Bank, if they did nonviolent, I think they just, you know, they would just settle the, the Israelis would just settle the West Bank. That would be it. Hmm. But the, the Israelis, the Israelis, the, the Israeli settlements, I mean, have been, have been expanding. I mean, and I think that that's, uh, there, there is a settler movement there, and it's a real thing. And you know, if the Pal- if the Palestinians just lay down, maybe, maybe you know, who knows? Maybe it'll apply. Maybe the Israeli left will have more of a 
uh, influence and maybe they all stand up to them, but maybe, maybe not. Maybe they'll just be, you know. Yeah, I mean, what I'm more. kind of thinking is, uh, and that what's made India so successful, if people see the gun pointed at someone who's obviously defenseless and obviously not threatening with violence, that has a very strong or powerful effect, right? Not even just in media, but also like on the people on the other side, like what are we really doing here? Right. So I'm not saying yeah, that's guaranteed to work, but you know, it has yeah. worked in the past, right? Violence yeah. is also not guaranteed to work. I mean, it works. It works. And, you know, it depends on the context, whether it works for, against the British empire, it's not going to work in North Korea or China or something. Um, and Israel, will it work in Israel? Yeah. It's a question. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's, uh, advantages to it and there's obviously clearly disadvantages. Yeah. 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 The other thing I was wondering if you thought about in your work on international relations is, so you had this post about wars of necessity where you talked about um, asymmetric conflict victories, right? So, and you're saying that the weaker actor increasingly has higher odds of winning in an asymmetric conflict. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a bit about that because that also indicates that defense technology is shifting, right? And you as the actor with the strong army, the strong weapons, it's increasingly harder for you to, to operate, right? So what yeah. does it say about um, how, you know, defense policy should look like in the, in the 21st century? Yeah, I think that the, um, I think it's actually probably, you know, technology shifts, but I think technology probably helps the stronger side more. I think it's more the ideas shift and the sort of the fact that we're fighting wars of choice is why the weaker side is winning uh, more often. Um, because, you know, you have the technology that helps the, the weaker side, but also you have nuclear weapons on the stronger side. You have uh, surveillance technology that's very, you know, far advanced um, that uh, colonial powers or strong states didn't really have before. Um, you have drones and, you know, so, so forth. Um, and so, yeah, you know, I think that it's probably not the tech. It's the technology probably makes it easier for it's like crime. You know, it's easier to fight crime now. Um, we have, you know, facial recognition we could be using. We have DNA technology. We can, we can, we can have no crime if we wanted to. Um, but we have ideas about, you know, it's racist to arrest too many people or, you know, we shouldn't, we should give people a chance and, uh, you know, you shouldn't like arrest people for small things. You know, we have these ideas and these laws and regulations that make it more difficult. So I think it's this, I think it's something similar with regards to warfare. I think it's probably easier to pacify, uh, other countries and to, to beat them in wars. Um, that, you know, or, or, uh, or, uh, non-state movements, you know, guerrilla movements and such, uh, it's just harder to do so politically. It's harder to do so politically. So that was the main reason that the weak actor wins more often. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Not that's, really that's, that's the technology. <laughs> right. Okay. Yeah, I think technology goes in the other direction. If I had, if I had to get, nobody knows for sure, but if I had to guess, I'd say it's a very good chance that technology goes in the other direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I'm wondering, always wondering, because I've been in the military myself, and what I find remarkable about it is that the military is organized like socialism, right? It's a completely planned economy. And that means it's very ineffective and inefficient at many things. So, yeah. and is it's there like another a constant. Way to do it, well, that's the question. You know, there is private decentralized armies, right? Estonia has like volunteer armies, for example. And right, then it's Wagner so, and Russia, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the US, all, the US relies on, to a certain extent, does rely on contractors too. And the Russians, yeah. obviously, in, in Ukraine. Have also, in too, effect, so it seems like militaries can also operate, and it's like a very strong doctrine in the Navy. And also what I, and as a ground soldier, learned is that you have to rely a lot on yourself and kind of deliberately sort of ignore the command structure if necessary. <laughs> Right, because mm. the ones up there, they don't always know what's going on. So there's a very strong culture around you have to be individualistic in this massive inefficient bureaucracy, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Where were you worried? You were, what, uh, what country? Israel? In, in Germany. Ah, in Germany. Okay. Obviously, yeah, in yeah. Israel. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's, most times you meet someone in the West and they, you know, they have military background. If they're a foreigner, it's, you, it's often Israel. A lot of people. Yeah, 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 Israel. yeah. But yeah, that was one of my takeaways. Like these, um, you know, they had, I was, they sent like this, the guy who had the most like bodybuilding mass to go into, uh, he, they sent them to be a waiter, right? And then this other guy who was like, pretty fat and pretty stupid they sent him like to the toughest as nails mountain engineers right mm -hmm. so it's like how do these militaries operate and then i'm increasingly is it, also is it in purpose is it on purpose maybe they need to make the fat guy tougher 
I don't know. Is there a plan? I don't think that was part of the plan. But, no. um, you know, reading also about sort of the deployment of like US bases and things like that, it seems to me there's just this enormous amount of waste going on, right? So, and I, you know, just like any other large centralized entities, I just think there's enormous inefficiencies, right? And it's especially hard to... Um, yeah, so I wonder if if we sort of if that sort of model, like one centralized army, will be something that will persist in the twenty first yeah. century. <laughs> I mean, maybe that's maybe that's one reason the smaller uh, are winning wars. Maybe they're too big and too centralized. The modern armies and the insurgents are sort of more Darwinian process of selection, and they're you know, they're, they're you know smarter and better at what they do. Maybe that sort of makes sense. Would that have changed over time? I don't know. Maybe that doesn't explain change over time because countries were. Always centralized, and guerrillas were also always less centralized. Well, maybe, maybe they were. Maybe the guerrillas used to be more centralized because they were, uh, uh, you know, there was only like one guerrilla movement. I, I don't, I don't know if this is historically accurate. Now it's easy. Anybody, a few people can get together with guns, right? Roadside bombs, they can fight. So maybe there's more competition. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. Also, when you're not centralized, when you're centralized, you have one command center. Right, and then if you neutralize that command center, then all the other user units are confused and don't know what to do. Whereas when you like guerrillas in this one town and you neutralize them, you still have to deal with the guerrilla in the other town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anything else to say about American foreign policy and what are you thinking about right now? Well, uh, not re not really. I'm uh, sort of. Um... Yeah, American American foreign policy. I think it's going to be very interesting to see the extent to which, uh, you know, where this goes in the Israeli conflict because they, you know, like it's a it's a tragic situation. But I, you know, I think that like the question of, you know, whether this is different from previous wars because the number of people killed, the damage Israel has done to, to Gaza is off the charts relative to former uh, wars in the Middle East. This is you know closer to. Uh, you know, it's getting close to something like, you know, Syrian civil war or something as far as the aggression with which Israel's fighting it. Israel's obviously a lot more competent than the uh, Syrian government. Um, and so, yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, we'll see if this changes things. I mean, it's sort of like Bukele, you know, when he cracked down on crime, uh, you know, you're in Central America, but you probably uh, know about this well. Um, you know, he just went further than everyone else and he eventually solved the problem. I, I you know, the, there's no way to completely solve the um, Palestinian problem because they're still be there. I mean, you could have them as refugees. Unfortunately, everyone is against this. I mean, this is a, you know, the uh, Arabs don't want to take them and the Westerners, of course, are not going to take them. And who knows? And Hamas probably is not letting them, going to let them leave. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, they're just going to suffer in a really bad situation. The question is whether Israeli um, security needs are met by the end of this. And, you know, I would guess that they are, but, you know, we'll see. This is something new. Yeah, yeah. Uh, do you have another book planning? Do you, are you planning to write another book anytime soon or another big project? Not really, no. I mean, people should just come to my sub stack. I'm writing essays now. I have a few essays uh, in the work, but I don't have like a big project, whether I'll have a big project in a book uh, or I'll just, you know, write, uh, you know, write essays and be on Twitter. And likewise, uh, you know, I don't, I don't know yet. I'm sort of just thinking about that now. Okay. Any other kind of support you want to list or, you know, looking to fundraise for any organizations or want to draw attention oh, yeah. to something of our listeners? I mean, CSPI, we're always, you know, we're always looking for funding. It supports my work. It supports the work of, uh, you know, other people. You go to our website, uh, CSPI uh, Center. Dot, I think it's dot .com now. The old one was dot .org. Yeah, CSPI Center dot .com. Um, we have, you know, podcasts. We have a lot of cool reports. We've done stuff on campus climate. Um, uh, we've done stuff on COVID when that was an issue. Um, you know, we've done stuff on, um, uh, uh, the Russia, Ukraine war. Um, and so, yeah, you know, people can be in touch with me through, you know, Twitter or my sub stack, um, or they can follow CSPI on, on Twitter. They can follow me on Twitter. Um, and yeah, you know, we're always, you know, looking for, looking for help on that. And yeah, for everyone else, I'm just follow me on Twitter, follow me on sub stack. It's all under my own name and you'll, you'll stay up to date on what I'm doing. Fantastic. Richard, it was really awesome intellectual ride from Nietzsche and liberal liberalism to grand strategy and foreign policy. Really enjoy blazing through these super interesting topics with you and having a conversation. So thanks so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you, Nicholas. I really enjoyed it.